add another uh, dimension of where Inuit can address their concerns. So going back to the permanent participant part, for my office, most of our work is done at the Arctic Council. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Arctic Council itself, but not so many people are as familiar with who the permanent participants are at the Arctic Council. So that's what we are, and we, we just call it PPs. Um, in fact, ICC was instrumental in starting the Arctic Council um, through, through, you know, this was about, uh, close to 20 years after ICC had started, but with the understanding that, again, we needed everybody to come together to start addressing common concerns through some type of um, cooperation. So at the Arctic Council, it's made up of eight countries and six permanent participants. And the permanent participants you'll see are, oh, there we go. <laughs> The permanent participants are, um, that were already in effect were RIPON, which represents, I think, around 57 indigenous groups in Russia, and Salmon Council and ICC. Um, three additional permanent participants were, or three additional organizations were developed following um, the, the, the start of Arctic Council to further represent Aleut, Athabaskan, and Gwich'in. So it starts with um, the eight countries and permanent participants at the very top, and that's where we hear about senior Arctic officials, and that's the meeting that will be happening in Fairbanks at the same time as the Arctic Observing Summit. Um, from there, we go down to the six working groups, and so the PPs also need to, so my, my leadership is at the top there, but we also need to follow and work with the six working groups. So for myself, I cover the conservation of Arctic flora and fauna. So a lot of the things that we talk about here, we also try to implement there, but also within the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, within the Sustainable Development Working Group, and also the protection of the Arctic marine and environment. So the, the ICC gets its direction every four years when all our leadership come together from the four countries and give us a declaration that tells us what we need to focus on for the next following four years. Right now, we're acting under the Kitikarik Declaration. When we come back to our respective countries, our boards reinforce those, um, those, that guidance and further align it to what is necessary within our own country. For the last eight years, that's been food security at the top of our list for both of them. But these are some of the other issues that we engage in. And hopefully by the time we're done with this presentation, you'll see how all of these other topics are actually embedded in food security, or at least how we refer to food security. And then I'll just quickly share with you that within Alaska, the, this is the area um, that we refer to as the four Inuit regions. In Alaska, we, we don't use the word, word Inuit so much. We use the word Eskimo. Um, but in Canada and Greenland, it's not thought of as a, a good word. And so our leadership made a compromise in 79 to say, okay, we'll say Inuit. But if you come to Alaska and you come into our regions, you'll still hear people refer to themselves as Eskimo. Um, but, but also what p the groups of people that are here are in Nupiat, St. Lawrence Island, Yupik, Chupik, and Central Yupik. There's 95 tribal councils within these four regions and within 81 villages. All of them were engaged in, in this project that I'm going to share with you in just a moment. Okay, going to the project then. I think that you guys have all become familiar, at least with the term food security, right? We're hearing it all the time in media and research and policy. But a, a while ago, when my bosses started talking about food security at the Arctic Council and at the UN, they really found that people were talking about something very different than what they were talking about. I mean, they were very focused on purchasing power, nutrient, and caloric intake, and those things are really important. They're, they're definitely part of what we're talking about when we say food security, but they're not the whole picture. And with this realization came the realization that when we're asking people to look at the environment holistically, we're not being very clear because we're not being clear of what we mean by food security because those two things are, are going hand in hand with each other. And so from that, that this project was, was born. And although we're international, this particular project just, just takes place in Alaska. 
So to get a better idea here of what we're talking about for food security, we'll just start to explain by looking at this kind of food web here. This is an Alaska Inuit kind of food web where you see uh, lots of different types of things going on. If, we're, if we put in scientific terms, we see biological, physical, and social elements going on here. And the best way that it was ever explained to me is when an elder told me that the Arctic is like a puzzle. And we've got all these pieces um, that need to fit together, and they've always fit together. And they adjust and they move around because it's a very dynamic environment. But these pieces can be, this one piece can be language and another piece culture. Another piece can be physical elements of the ocean um, or benthic species or whales. But the whole idea is that all of this is needed to be put together. As scientists, we can understand these pieces to be um, systems, right? We know that systems interlink with each other and that they, that they need to interlink. Um, if we go far enough into the discussion, you'll start to understand, too, that uh, at least here, indigenous knowledge is really telling us that the greatest point of vulnerabilities are where those interlinks are, to, are where the systems are interlinking with each other. Because if, that, if that's not very stable, or if it's broken, rather, then, then it starts to have a cumulative impact across the, entire, across the entire system. So with this, we, we understand that Inuit have a unique way of, of understanding um, food security. So, so you have to kind of just take away whatever you thought of food security for, for just the next 15 minutes, actually. <laughs> so, with this project, we set out to do a couple of things. One was to define Alaska Inuit food security. The other one was we identified 58 drivers of food security and insecurity. We also created a conceptual framework that guides us through what information is needed in order to do an assessment of the environment. I'm not going to put the full definition up here. And also, just, just because of time and interest, we're not going to go through the whole methodology. But what's really important to note is that what I share with you today is the product of 146 Alaskan Inuit who are all indigenous knowledge holders and a nine-member advisory committee, eight of which are indigenous knowledge holders and one is a cultural anthropologist. So what's really important about this project is it's 100% driven by Inuit. It's what they have to share. And that makes it very unique. For the definition, I would urge all of you to take a look at the executive summary that was shared with you, and even the um, summary and recommendation report. So I'll let you read through the entire definition, but just to set things in, um, to, to kind of give a sense of what we're talking about here, I'll just read the first line. So Alaska Inuit food security is the natural right of all Inuit to be part of the ecosystem, to access food, to caretake, protect, and respect all of life, land, water, and air. The key part here to, to really understand is Inuit culture is part of the ecosystem. It, so when we're talking about all of this, we're talking all of it about all of it as a whole. And that becomes a little bit clearer when we look at the conceptual framework. Now, this is a drum because drums are very important to our culture. And what's always funny to me about this drum is it took us three and a half years to draw. <laughs> but but it, it, it is jam-packed with um, with information and concepts. And so I'm just gonna explain how it flows. And, and when, when I'm explaining this, maybe try to think about the data that you tend to work with and how it would move across this kind of drum. So we start in the middle with food security and surrounding food security is what characterizes food security. Um, that's our environmental health. Again, remembering that we see environment as everything, including culture. It's that puzzle of the Arctic again. Surrounding that are the six dimensions that are needed to make up a healthy environment, and that's availability, Inuit culture, decision-making power and management, health and wellness, stability, and accessibility. So just like the term food security, we want to be careful not to automatically assume what those terms mean. And if you read through the report, you'll get a better understanding of what we mean by them. But just for example, when we say health and wellness, it's not just health and wellness of human beings. It's health and wellness of the air, of animals, 
and even the relationship between human beings and all of those other elements around them. Surrounding the six dimensions are the tools needed to support those dimensions, and that's knowledge sources. This really gets to the root of needing both indigenous knowledge and science. Also policy and co-management. Here in Alaska, what we've realized is, again, just like food security, maybe we have different understandings of what we mean when we say co-management. Surrounding the drum is like sinew. Um, you guys know what you sew together with, sew the drum together with, and that's the spirit of all, and it's written in the four languages that are throughout our four regions. Holding the drum up is the drum handle, and that's food sovereignty. And this is true of every culture of every country, without food sovereignty, food security is not going to exist. One thing that the advisory committee really wants us to make sure to um, share whenever we're sharing this presentation is that if any piece of this drum is missing, if any piece is weak or starting to fall off the drum, then food security is at threat because this is the entire, again, the entire ecosystem that we're talking about here. Please stop me if anybody has questions right away. So before, you know, the, the report or the work came out with many, many, many recommendations, and there's probably many more recommendations that could, could be developed. Um, but before we go into that, I, I just wanted to share a couple of concept maps that show how these dimensions, how these pieces are interlinked with each other. And, and again, if you could just try to think of it in terms of the, the type of data that you collect and how you would be moving this data through these different pieces. So here we have a conceptual um, map of sea ice coverage, sea ice thickness, and timing of sea ice formation and breakup. I'm gonna just break this in two because it's difficult to see like that. So here we see how these things are all interconnected with each other. So we'll just, we'll choose one of them. We'll go from a decrease in sea ice coverage. A, de a decrease in sea ice coverage results in a decrease in, or can result in a decrease in accessibility to hunting areas. This results in hunting strategies have to be changed to acquire for more time to be able to go hunting, to travel further distances, which causes more, um, Un, which puts hunters in unsafe environments. It causes a, an increase in the amount of fuel that is needed and other resources. Like I said, this is connected to unsafe traveling conditions that can be caused by rotten and thin ice. The decrease in sea ice coverage also results in a loss of protection to villages that are protected from storm surges by the ice that's packed up. On the other hand, in some areas when the ice is packed up, it can decrease accessibility out to the animals. And this can cause a lost opportunity for transfer of knowledge. Those are, that's the connection between this physical element and the social structure that, that is embedded within the Inuit culture. The other side of it, we've got, um, I'm just looking for the right one. <laughs> Okay, so if we have timing of sea ice formation and breakup, um, early breakup we, results in, uh, we have to think of seals that utilize pressure ridges for denning and, and ice breaks. So as the dens open up, they leave the pups vulnerable to ravens, foxes, polar bears, and other predators. So quite a few hunters are expressing a concern of what, what impact this is going to ultimately have on food web dynamics. Let's take another one with look at another one with a more specific example here. Um, so this one is about walrus. And you can see lining around this concept map the different um, dimensions that we had talked about and how they're all interlinked with each other. But I'm, I'm just going to tell a quick story that connects all of these elements through indigenous knowledge um, to think about data that would come from physical scientists, from biological scientists, from social scientists, and now Inuit um, take their indigenous knowledge and they're taking all of that information in together. They need all of the information together to be able to make decisions. 
So if we think of a decrease in sea ice thickness, walrus use uh, sea ice to, 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 to uh, rest, right? I, I think everybody's familiar with that. The thickness of the sea ice is really important. It's also really important in determining where they're going to um, have their young for, for them to be safe. The sea ice thickness, um, according to the indigenous knowledge, is also related to the benthic species and to the currents and to the level of stratification that is occurring within, within the waters, in, especially um, in connection with near shore currents. So people are seeing a shift in benthic species, and they're seeing an increase in stratification. They're seeing a change in near shore ocean currents, and all of this is related to walrus and sea ice thickness. Now we have to think about when hunters go out to, to get walrus. Well, young, young boys are taken out, but, and now even young girls are starting to be taken out also. When they're taken out, they're really rooted in who they are within their environment. This is where they learn their relationship with the environment, where they learn their language. You know, there's different words in different parts of the culture to define um, what age a walrus is, where that walrus is normally located, associated with different types of sea ice thickness or different um, levels of sea ice thickness. Even, even names associated with different areas of the water that have historically tended to be more, uh, have a heavier salinity than other areas. All of this is taken in by, by those youths. When, once they've got their walrus, they come back to shore and they have to share um, their first catch with an elder. And at that point, that youth becomes a provider as opposed to being provided for. This is completely our cultural identity. This is self-identity. This is that connection, that positive feedback loop again to being part of an ecosystem. So now we'll just go through, um, I'll just go through a couple of the recommendations that might be of interest to you guys. Although again, I, I would really encourage you to take a look at all of them um, because cause I think that you'll find a lot of them of, of interest to you. So here, um, one of the huge recommendations people have is an enhance in monitoring of pollutants throughout the habitat. People really need and need more more monitoring going on, and this is where the science is really needed. The data is really important for understanding what what impacts people from around the world are having on the Arctic through pollutant transference. But it's also important to have the indigenous knowledge there to help give con context to how all of that interlinks, how that data is used like within the walrus concept map that we just shared. Another one was to support research focused on gaining a stronger understanding of the changes occurring within physical elements of the ocean in association with changes in food web dynamics. That's a mouthful, but the bottom line there is people are really seeing not only a need for science to be working more equitably with indigenous knowledge, but for scientist disciplines to be working more collaboratively with each other. That in order to understand anything about the walrus, we also need to understand abiotic features. So that again goes back to indigenous knowledge tells us, if you're going to talk about the walrus, you better know something about sea ice thickness and about ocean stratification and many other components. Another one is enhancing monitoring programs through all Alaskan Inuit communities. Enhancing monitoring programs based on both IK and scientific methodologies. Enhancing monitoring programs through the use of modern technologies such as recorders and cameras. This one really starts to get at people like using satellite data. They like using um, data and information that comes from, from science. But again, they need it to be able to put in context and move across scales and across different disciplines. And especially they need it with the indigenous knowledge. And something really important to realize in monitoring through indigenous knowledge, at least here for Alaskan Inuit, is we're really concentrated on the relationships between components. So we're really concerned about the relationship between the walrus and the sea ice thickness. 
as opposed to only the sea ice thickness or only the walrus. Another one is to increase understanding of food security through the identification of combined variables. That's exactly what we were just talking about. But the important part there is to allow for community level identification of interconnecting stressors and drivers to identify levels of vulnerability. So that means we really need for data to be, again, able to cross those scales. It's only at the very community level, at that really important level where people are on the ground, where they can give a complete context to that information as it applies to that local environment. And so it's important to work with them really closely to see how, how can the information get directly there and how can it be used across those scales? Because they're then going to need to use that information and how they interpret it to push it back up the scales again to affect really large-scale policy decisions. Another one is to document health and wellness indicators based on indigenous knowledge and science. Um, this is really important because it's, it's absolutely not saying that one way is right or one way is wrong, but in fact, it's saying the exact opposite. It's saying we need to realize that there's multiple ways of looking at this environment. The Inuit way is looking at it a little bit more holistically. So in developing indicators, those indicators are going to be based on those relationships. And so we need the data to be able to work in that, in that way. And through all of this, we have to be really careful about how we're categorizing and sharing the information. Because again, we're going to be categorizing it differently. So I think just, just to recap in, in what we're talking about for data needs, I think another recommendation that, a couple more recommendations that we're really stressed in communities or communities need to be able to increase their capability to uh, share information with each other. Um, this, this has a lot to do, again, with transferring information across scales. But they also need access to information at all times. So whether you're a hunter, a tribal council, a, a, a regional organization or an international organization like ICC, we need to be able to have access to any kind of data that's being generated out of, out of our homes. So when we, again, consider data, we, we've got to consider how, how can we move that data across these scales? How, how can we use them to, be, to support what we need to do in higher policy? Um, because a lot of this has really higher policy implications, such as how to establish adequate conservation plans or how to safeguard this environment as a whole. We need the data to be able to do that. But we also need the data not to be in silos in order to do that. It, you know, when we're, when we're creating these kind of platforms that we're going to start, where we're going to start having the data build up, if we don't have it constructed in a way that is going to allow it to link to other, other questions or other uh, scales, it becomes really challenging to access it. So we have to consider um, the recommendation regarding ocean physical elements and the relation of, to overall food webs. Again, there we need both the physical and biological data together. And, and again, remembering that that boy is giving his first catch to an elder and that that's his self-identity. So that information is needed there also. And with that, I, I would just like to um, thank everybody. So Cornell Pluck for, for um, patiently letting me talk through all of that. And I, I think um, Peter was saying that we could have a discussion now a little bit, to go a little bit more in depth with some of this. Yes, yeah, certainly, Carolina. We have about 10 to 15 minutes uh, budgeted um, for questions and discussion. So I would open the floor to anybody who would like to, uh, to ask questions or, or make a comment. So maybe I'll get us started. Um, Carolina, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for the presentation. And it, it really helps me to understand the, the complexity of the systems that, that you're looking at here. Um, again, we, we see or we hear the term food security, but it's obviously 
much more complex from that, uh, much more complex than that. And you you talked about the need for you know linking across systems and and through scales. In your meetings um, with communities, did you get a sense that um, they have all of the knowledge, information, and data, and particularly the information and data that they need? And if they don't, um, did they talk about the reasons for that? Was it more policy? Was it more technical? Um, was it uh, legal, for example? You know, they know data exists, but they can't legally get access to it because it's proprietary. Were, were there those kind of discussions when you were talking about the various um, information and data aspects? Yes, it was um, all of the above, absolutely. So there, there is a real concern about information being generated out of people's homes, but they can't access that information. Um, so that could be for various reasons, one being the researchers didn't have enough funding to feed it back to the community, or they didn't have the language um, to be able to, to give it back to the community, but also that people want the raw data also. They want to be able to access the raw data to use when they need to use it. Um, and at times that means they want relationships with scientists to be learn how to interpret the information also. Actually, I think most of the time that, that's true. But it's also, it's also oftentimes the, the form that the information is coming in that it, again, they need it to be able to address connections about or address questions about relationships between components, which means that the data can't sit by itself in silos. And, and so that, that might just have to do with how we're categorizing even the scientific data. There is also, also um, technology limitations of people being able to access the information, whether that means um, lack of internet or, or even having the knowledge of how to use or access some, some information or some data sets. Um, there, there's a need to, to have that also. And Carolina, this is Joe. Just to follow up on that technology, is um, to what extent is that a big issue with respect to accessibility to some kind of internet connection, be it low bandwidth or otherwise? Uh, I, I would say that it's a, a huge a huge issue. I mean, think of I don't know. Think if I wanted to access some data, some raw data from the National Soil and ICE Data Center, we, we could be talking about large, large lists of numbers, right? <laughs> that's going to take even me in Anchorage a long time to download something. So I, I, I think that that's a large issue. A, a larger issue, though, too, is even the whole infrastructure landscape of not just the technology itself, but even being able to set up stronger networks even just between indigenous organizations so that they can be sharing information more freely and quickly. And so for that, we, we definitely need technology. I know Peter and I have talked a lot about that before, but we also need to consider about how the information is categorized and how, how it can be put into a usable format um, um, for people. So in, another way that categorization occurs within Alaska Inuit is through seasons, um, and we have more seasons than four seasons. Some people have seven seasons, and other areas have three seasons. The seasons are defined by the movement of the animals and the plants and the movement of the ice. And so a lot of times indigenous knowledge, people are, are gathering information that feeds into their indigenous knowledge, is categorized into those seasons. So just thinking about that in terms of how do we how do we match that up with raw data that isn't categorized through seasons? And not saying that it does need to be, but just thinking about how do we create an interface between those so that people can use it on the ground. Carolina? Oh, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, just as a follow-up to that, in terms of what is the, the primary method by which information uh, is collected? Uh, and, and, and by that I meant with the Inuit Nation folks that are on the ground. How is that done? For indigenous knowledge? Yes. 
I think there's I think there's different ways. So there's quite a few organizations that do this in very advanced kind of ways that they make recordings. They they do a lot in in scientific terms, um, semi-directed interviews. But also a lot of this isn't quite organized. You know, you, you can go to a village, to Natuliak on the Yukon River, or sorry, the Kuskokwim River, and go into a school there, and you'll find hundreds of audio tapes of semi-directive interviews conducted from children and older adults to elders. That's a huge amount of indigenous knowledge that's there. But traditionally, indigenous knowledge is not just documented um, in terms of I'm writing down these observations for today. Um, it's, it's something that is gathered from individuals and then given to somebody with a higher set of knowledge who they then discuss it. It's then given to the elders. They then discuss it and analyze and evaluate that information and give it back to the original user again. And the information cycles through that way. We find documentation of it in art, in music, in dance, but also in maps in drawings. So, for example, there's three villages um, in one area that gets together every single year with youth, adults, and elders who then draw out the entire area around them, and the adults then put, draw out on top of that any changes that they have seen. The elders then interpret it for them and tell them how to use that information. They then throw the map away every year. <laughs> so it's not stored in the same way. Okay. Carolina, this is Sarah. Um, I have a question because we struggled in um, the terrestrial ecosystems team with a milestone that they have that is linking the traditional knowledge and subsistence information to food security. It's really bad feedback right now. I know I don't know why. Sorry. Um, and it, it mostly it's because the knowledge and the information is proprietary. Um, can you does your report discuss that aspect? Um, the for this knowledge being proprietary. Uh, the traditional knowledge of hunting grounds and so forth yeah. being proprietary from the subsistence hunters' perspective. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think the report goes slightly into it, but I can I can discuss more than than what the report says. Um, you, you know, if you think about science 300 years ago, it had a lot to figure out, right? <laughs> Especially as far as sharing information, and sometimes it feels like um, indigenous knowledge is at that point right now, where it's trying to c catch up to that conversation of how to share this information. But also what we've had happen over the last 100 years is a lot of misuse of indigenous knowledge, and at times to the, to the harm of people in communities. And not, not to go into too much negativity here, but we see a lot of people cherry picking indigenous knowledge where they have an argument that they want to make and they'll just go pick whatever indigenous knowledge or pieces of that indigenous knowledge to support it. And so for us, to, for us to get to a point where there's more trust in the use of indigenous knowledge, there's, there's quite a few things that we need to become, that everybody, not just inside Inuit communities, but everybody needs to start to inherently agree upon. Um, and that, that starts with understanding what indigenous knowledge is. We often hear people talk about it in context as just observations, but, but in fact it has an evaluation validation process and it's a systematic way of thinking. It has methodologies. Um, so even just recognizing it as that is really important. But then also having these kind of ethical understandings that we see with science also. Even though it does happen that people misuse each other's science and, and, um, and even steal it at times, it, it, it at least is socially unacceptable for that to happen. <clears throat> that be better understood that that's true for indigenous knowledge also. When indigenous information from indigenous knowledge is shared with me, I have a responsibility of how to use that information. There's also different, um, you know, you're, you're, it, you're not just an indigenous knowledge holder because you're uh, Inuit or an indigenous person, right? You, you have to grow to that responsibility and grow to enough knowledge to be able to 
be called an indigenous knowledge holder. And this goes to the same idea of who are the experts in the knowledge need to be able to interpret that knowledge to everybody else. So I, I, I always tell people, if, if you give me some physics, I will tell you a really nice story because I am terrible at physics. <laughs> it's the same thing with indigenous knowledge. You need the indigenous knowledge holders there to interpret. So right now I'm involved in quite a few monitoring initiatives under the conservation of Arctic flora and fauna, and they set up these different networks where they have scientists from different disciplines working collaboratively together. If, if we were to honestly expect indigenous knowledge to be in that group, an indigenous knowledge holder has to be there to interpret what the information is. I think as we move closer to those things, to those types of understandings, we'll be able to lighten up a little bit of the, the concern and outcry for pr proprietary rights associated with indigenous knowledge. Carolina, that, that was a great response. And um, I, I'm going to uh, email you at, uh, later and share with you the milestone that we're struggling with, um, because I'd like you to jot down a couple of those sentences about the need for the, the, the holder of the knowledge to be part of the process um, and, and see if we can keep working with you to figure out a way to address this milestone. I think it was a well-intentioned milestone. I just think it's very difficult to figure out a way to move forward. Hi. Can I raise my hand? This is Peter Griffin. <clears throat> Hello? Go ahead, Peter. Yes, thank you. Uh, so um, we've been thinking about this with, uh, with um, NASA's Above project, and I have a draft of a data policy for the above science team. And Carolina has been very kind to uh, review, go through a couple of loops of review on that with me. And uh, I don't mean that it's uh, th that it's the, the most definitive thing ever written in this regard, but I've, I've tried to, for the first time in a NASA data poli policy, uh, add in uh, recognition of um, of, of rights of indigenous knowledge holders uh, and how you know our science team should recognize and respect and deal with that. So that's um, something I could share with people who are interested in seeing it. Yeah, that was really exciting, Peter. We really appreciated that you did that. Some, something else that was really interesting to me when I was at the above um, when, when I was lucky enough to attend the above workshop, was there, there was a gentleman there that works in the Bay Area for NASA that's a modeler, and, um, but I, I've got to look at what his name is, but he had worked in the Amazon rainforest with indigenous peoples for many years, and when he talked about the need to um, bring together science and indigenous knowledge variables or to in order to identify variables needed in models. He used language that I, I myself was very comfortable with that really kind of demonstrated to me that he had a better understanding of what that meant. And, and so I actually have been meaning to get back together with you because that, that really goes directly to what we're talking about when we say thinking about how to use data, how to make it go across different scales, and how indigenous knowledge um, and, and communities can be using that information. So I, I think that that'll be really interesting to see what comes up out of that group also. Do you remember who that was? I, I've got to look at the roster of who was there. Um, he was just a young gentleman that works in the Bay Area for NASA. And was, I, it I Josh, think was it Josh Fisher? Yeah, yeah, that's who it is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I actually have been meaning to try to get his name to link him with some other people. Well, thank you for that, Peter. That was a great, uh, a great comment, and we would actually, yeah, be very interested in seeing that uh, once it's complete. Um,